All right, y'all turn to Ephesians chapter 4. All right, we're going to go real slow and do something real basic today. I hope it'll be a little different than maybe we've done it in the past, but it's something that we need to make sure we do. In Ephesians chapter 4, while everybody's turning there, I mind anybody that wants DVDs or CDs, let us know. We'll send you whatever you want. Um, anybody that's coming to the uh, Bible study in October, if you hadn't let me know yet, please let me know. If you don't have a room yet, let me know about that so I can get that for you. Also, the, on the YouTube banner, if you see there's a little Wix symbol there, Lexi made a, a little website, and you click on it, and it's got notes on there, but not for today. I don't have any notes for today. I just jotted down some verses, but you can get old notes there. All right. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul is talking, and he's talking about, in verse 4 he says, there is one body. Now, does that mean one human body? One spiritual body. What's that body called? The church, the body of Christ, right? There is one body. Now, he doesn't say there is, present tense, two bodies, us that believe from me forward and them, Peter and them. He don't say that. He says there is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. Then does that body have one hope and calling? Then do they have separate things or is it the same? It's the same. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now, we talked about last week there was a period of time when there was four baptisms, wasn't there? But now when Paul writes this, there's one baptism. He says, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. But unto every one of us it is, present tense, given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Now verse 11. And he gave. Notice that doesn't say gives. This is past tense when Paul wrote, right? He gave some apostles. Was he still giving apostles or was that past tense when Paul wrote? past tense. If a man claims to be an apostle today, that man is outside of, the, of his authority in the Word of God. Okay? He gave some apostles and some prophets. Have you all heard all these folks today claiming to be prophets? And they've all got some prophecy and the Lord said this and the Lord said that. When the Lord gave us His Word, you all know what He said about it? He said it was complete and that a man of God could be Truly or thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Then what's our authority today? It's the Word of God. How do you know if what I'm telling you today is actually the Word of God or not? Look in the Word of God and see, right? What if I sitting here and while we're talking, I say, oh, wait a minute. And uh, what was that show we used to watch, Lexi? With the, the guy would hop up and he would go, oh, oh, and he would get a message from outer space. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, that was, uh, third, rock. third rock from the sun. <laughs> Yeah, well, third rock from the sun, the guy had like he was, oh, and he was getting a message from somewhere else, right? Folks, that's real similar to what men are doing today. They're claiming that they have the words of God coming to them from somewhere, don't they? Hey, Bobby. So he says, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now, verse 12 tells us what these were given for. For, right? For the perfecting. Perfecting means the equipping, the maturing, the supplying. It doesn't mean getting the person beyond the sin nature. It's talking about perfecting this person with what they need. For the perfecting of the saints. Then why did he give those gifts we just read? For the perfecting of the saints. Did he give those gifts for the glory of the individual that had different gifts? No. Nope. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. What does edifying mean? Building up, okay? A person has a child. You have a, a couple has a little child, and from the time that child's born, what is that couple's responsibility? To raise that child. Are they not building that child up? I mean, they've got to build him up physically. It's their responsibility to supply him with bread and water and food and everything he needs, milk, everything, right? But what other responsibility do they have? You've got to educate him and teach him, right? Now, there's a third component to that. Parents are supposed to spiritually educate that child, aren't they? That ain't happening in our country today. That's one of the reasons we, things look the way they look. But he says, For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ, till, 
Now there's a time word. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Now don't let somebody tell you perfect means without sin. Has there ever been a human being that overcame their sin nature? You ain't never met one. When he says to the, unto a perfect man, it's the same word. It's the mature man, unto a, a full-grown man. In other words, not a little child anymore, okay? Unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children. Now, Paul wasn't a little kid. Paul was saved when he was an adult, wasn't he? But he says that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. All right, if I had a little kid in here today that was three or four years old, could I as an adult tell that little kid just about anything and they believe it? Okay, that's what's going on in the religious world today. Men say, oh, I just got a message from God and the people just believe it, don't they? Why do they just believe these characters? they're not established in the Word of God. Now, how are you going to get established in the Word of God? You're going to have to study, right? Okay. Now, I want you all to, let's do it like this. Let's talk about, <clears throat> all right, we've got a picture in the Old Testament that's a perfect picture. We've got all Israel's history, don't we? And Israel's history, according to Paul, is a type or an example for something, isn't it? So I've got Israel back here. And I got, I'm just going to come over here and put the body. Okay, we'll put the body of Christ over here. All right. <clears throat> Let's say, uh, all right, does a baby suck a pacifier? Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, that's all right, isn't it? What would y'all think? I'll use Chris because he never cares. What would y'all think if Chris came in today? What would you think, first off, if a five-year-old come in sucking a pacifier? You wouldn't think much. You'd think, well, that's getting a little old, right? Like on Game of Thrones, a little 12-year-old breastfeeding. That was shocking, wasn't it? You're like, what in the world? <laughs> right? But if we saw a four- or five-year-old sucking a pacifier, we would think they're immature, right? They're just a little immature. What if Chris come in today sucking a pacifier? <laughs> Dean would think that was normal for you? <laughs> There you go. You got it. Yes, ma'am. Miss Ruth has got it. All right. When Chris come in sucking a pacifier, nobody would think Chris is immature. We would think something wrong with him. <laughs> Something's wrong with him, right? Okay. The, the point being is he ought to be so far past that point. What in the world is he doing? You would immediately start thinking there's something wrong with his thinking, right? He, my mom was a school teacher. <laughs> My mom was a, a school teacher about oh, maybe 20 years ago in the Biloxi school system, and I went to have lunch with her one day, and I kid y'all not, there were 8th grade students with pacifiers. Did y'all know about that well, going they on? Had like they had a thing. My mom said they're douchey, and they wouldn't let them do anything about it. They had things around their necks, and they sitting in class sucking pacifiers. Yeah. Huh? No, 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 no. It was pacifiers. Yeah. That was, a, that was a trend they were doing there for a couple of years. I don't know if anybody knew it. You check it out. Don't believe me, okay? I didn't think, wow, what a bunch of immature children. I thought, this is nuts. What are they doing, right? Okay. When you and I look at the body of Christ, we're going to find out that the body of Christ had a beginning, didn't it? Now, who is the head of the body of Christ? Okay. When did Jesus Christ officially become the head of the body? At birth in the flesh? At resurrection, okay? When he's resurrected, Jesus Christ is now the head or the chief of the body. So the body of Christ had a beginning. What Paul is talking about is the maturing of the body of Christ. Folks, if you go out in the religious system today, what you see is you see a bunch of people sucking on spiritual pacifiers. Did the body of Christ have a birth back here? Were there some things that were given to them back here that they needed because they were like infants? If you found them repeating those things over here, you don't think, oh, that's cute. You think they're nuts. Folks, that's what's going on today. Seriously. All right, now, <clears throat> go over to, uh, let's see how to go about this. Ted, go over to, uh, I can't think how I want to. Well, just going over to 2 Corinthians. 
chapter 5. Chapter 5, yep, 2 Corinthians 5. I just want to read verse 7. All right, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, in parentheses, right in the middle of Paul's epistles, Paul says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Okay, does it say we walk by faith and not by sight, or does it say we walk by faith, not by by sight. Then is can you have one or the other, or do you have you got to make a choice, don't you? Now the body of Christ is supposed to be walking by faith. Does everybody agree with that? But when the body of Christ first starts back here, what are all its members? Jews. They're Jews, aren't they? Does the body of Christ start out predominantly Jewish, the church? It does. Well, since it starts out predominantly Jewish, guess what they had? They had a bunch of Jewish pacifiers, a bunch of things that you give the little kids. Okay, does that make sense so far? All right, go over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And these two things go hand in hand. God's plan is absolutely perfect. <clears throat> All right, in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17. The Apostle Paul says something that people today just absolutely don't know how to deal with. They really don't. He says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. However, when Paul first gets saved, does Paul get baptized? He does, doesn't he? Why did Paul get baptized? He didn't know any. He's a Jew, and the Jews had all these rituals, didn't they? But did Paul reach a point where Paul saw, I don't need to do that anymore? Yeah. Then Paul's kind of like taking the pacifier out of his mouth. He's growing spiritually. What did he say he was doing now? Baptizing or just preaching the gospel? Preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel okay? So we had some things happening back here that ought not be happening over here today. But once again, the church is like sucking on pacifier today. Okay, now with, with this in mind, what he says here, come on down to verse uh, uh, 22. He says, For the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. Now what does require mean? It's mandatory. Who said mandatory? Somebody, George, naturally. Somebody told me that day, I love George's comments. I thought, what, jo what about me, you know? <laughs> Y'all know I'm kidding. All right. So back here then, when Jesus Christ showed up over here, okay, did he show up and did he have a, a message for the nation Israel? Okay. So he starts preaching to Israel, literally the house of Judah in Jerusalem. And what do the Jews require? Signs. Signs. Okay. So while he's preaching to the Jews, if the Jews require a sign, how could God expect them to believe the message without giving them signs? He had promised them back here he would give them these signs. So he gives them these signs, doesn't he? Now, since the Jews never walked by faith and they walked by sight, did they ever believe? They saw the signs, but it never produced faith. I mean, y'all think about back here. Back here in the Old Testament, did Israel, when they come out of Egypt back here, we say, here's Egypt. Did they walk by faith or by sight? Therefore, what did all of them but two were guilty of? Unbelief. They saw the Red Sea part, didn't they? They walked down in it. They saw a cloud lead them. They saw bread fall down from heaven. And yet every time you turn around, you know what they're doing? Worshiping idols and wanting to go back to Egypt. Did they ever learn to trust the Lord? No. The reason they never learned to trust the Lord is because the Bible says they never had faith. Does that make sense so far? Okay. So when Jesus Christ shows up, the Bible said that he was going to, the, when the Messiah came, there was going to be some signs, wasn't there? One of the most powerful ones is that the blind would receive their sight. Had anybody ever healed blind folks before? Does Jesus Christ heal the blind? He does. What does it prove? He's a Messiah. Did he cleanse lepers and raise the dead? Did he do everything the Old Testament said he would do? Then did the signs prove who he was? And yet, what did his nation do? 
they rejected him. What does that teach you about walking by signs? Be leery of it, right? What's the world today? What is the body of Christ, or the I should say, what is the visible church today all going back to? Signs. Why would they? Why would y'all think they're going back to signs right now? What were they looking for at the first coming? Signs. Because they walked by sight and not by faith, they rejected their Messiah. What do y'all reckon is going to happen over here? And the same thing according to the Bible, isn't it? Are they being, uh, uh, what's the word, preconditioned? Are they having their minds conditioned today to look for signs? Y'all know this is going on everywhere, isn't it? Okay? Now, these signs back here correspond to something. The signs continue after the cross in the ministry of the twelve because they're still going to Israel, aren't they? Even in Paul's ministry, all through the book of Acts, Paul is still going to the Jew first, isn't he? And the Jews require a sign, so the apostle Paul's performing signs, isn't he? So we've got a little overlap here. The signs come over here to a point, and I'm just going to put that they stop right here because they do. Now, signs go into a point. During this point right here, and we're going to call this point the book of Acts, okay? What else did they not have during this period of time? Huh? They didn't have the whole word of God, okay? Go back over to, uh, uh, go to Mark 16. All right, in Mark 16, in verse 14, Jesus is talking to the 11. Now, why is it 11? Judas has killed himself. Okay, there's 11 of them. It says, Afterward he appeared unto the 11 as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Yet did he tell them over and over he was going to be resurrected. Why didn't they believe it? They don't have faith. They're walking by sight, aren't they? Now they're going to believe, and he's going to send them out to preach the gospel, he tells them. Watch what he tells them in verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. All right, so then when he sends them out over here, was baptism required to be saved? All right, is there going to come a point over here where in Acts 16 a man's going to ask Paul, what must I do to be saved, and what's Paul's answer? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Did Paul say anything about baptism? Then what in the world's going on? Is something changing? What's changing? The message is changing. It's becoming more mature, isn't it? Now he tells them here, verse 17, These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now he said right back here, these signs will follow them that believe, didn't he? Okay, so then, if I say today that I believe, if this is for me, then I ought to be able to do those signs, right? Either I can do those signs, or if I can't do them, I'm either lost or this doesn't apply to me. Does everybody agree with that? Can anybody in here raise the dead? Now, I've seen some people. I'm glad I can't, Miss Ruth. If I could, I'd love to be, I'd be like Benny Hinn. I'd be on TV doing all that junk, okay? Think about it. Raising the dead is a sign. What's it a sign for? What were these signs for? It was for the Jew to identify that these people were God's preachers. They go out on the day of Pentecost and they speak to a group in whatever language they need to speak. They all hear it in their own language, don't they? Was the sign or the miracle ever for the lifting up of the person doing it? What was the purpose? To, it's to, for the unbelievers. Watch the purpose of the sign, verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they, these eleven, went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Then what were the signs confirming? The word. What word? 
words they were preaching. Why did they need signs to confirm the words? Because they're preaching, number one, to Jews who require a sign, but number two, they're preaching a word that ain't written down yet. So, yeah, that... Yeah, really that's right. It is. It. I mean, look, folks, you get a smooth speaker, and that guy leads you anyway if you're not careful, won't he? All right, so then the, the miracles went along because the word wasn't written down yet, right? So God confirms their, their preaching by signs, doesn't he? Now, how do you confirm if what I'm telling you today is the word of God or not? You got it written down. If you need a sign, you're not taking God at his word. Has God already said all he's going to say? Yeah, folks, flip over to Hebrews 1. His word is. You got it. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. He says, God, who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Is that past tense? Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. What did John call Jesus Christ in John 1? He's the Word. Go on, Solomon. All right, so how did God then uh, do this? Flip over to chapter 2 and let's see how he did it previously with these men. Uh, chapter 2, verse 3, the writer says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? So they confirmed the words, didn't they? God also bearing them witness, both with signs, wonders, diverse miracles, gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. So God proved their words were from him by signs. Do you and I need signs today? We've got the complete Word of God. But what's the whole religious system doing today? They're going back to signs. Y'all remember Chris sucking on the pacifier? If you saw Chris sucking on a pacifier, you wouldn't say he's immature. You'd say there's something wrong with him. His thinking is fouled up, right? Well, there's something wrong today. The world system's thinking is fouled up. Who's fouling their thinking up? Satan is. It's a religious system. Flip back to 1 Timothy 4. All right, 1 Timothy 4, 1, Paul says, <clears throat> Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Did Paul understand he was writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Yeah. The Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, there's the one faith, isn't it, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, and he goes on from there. In other words, if they leave the faith, what is most of them turning back to today? The, the sight and law keeping. Okay? So then I've got a situation where, um, I, have any of y'all ever dealt with folks with uh, Alzheimer's? Hey, Trish, I know you. Okay. <laughs> we had, one of the things that I've noticed, I, I, I see them in the nursing homes, and it's kind of amazing to me. Folks, our brain is like a computer and all that information gets in there. You don't. It doesn't go away. We forget how to retrieve it or we can't retrieve it. But you can take an Alzheimer's patient that couldn't remember and all of a sudden at 80 years old they can remember four and five years old like that. They go back to that and it's all they talk about is childhood stuff. Y'all think about the body of Christ. The, the church started and it had some childish things back here signs, wonders, miracles, and it's like an Alzheimer's patient, they're all going back to their childish roots. Okay, now what did Paul tell us we need to do? Grow up. Okay, so let's just take a look at how some of this goes in the scripture. Go over first to uh, 1 Corinthians 13. First Corinthians 13, 8.
Hey, Christine, yeah, I, personally, I believe that's exactly what Psalm 139 is talking about. When Jesus Christ was raised out of hell, he's the head of the body in the beginning, and I believe that's, I, I agree exactly with what you said there. All right? 1 Corinthians 13, 8, Paul says, Charity never faileth. Fail means to fall off, to stop, to come to an end. Charity never faileth. But whether there be, present tense, prophecies, they shall fail. So when Paul wrote, prophecy was still in action, wasn't it? But was it going to fail or stop? Okay. Whether there be, present tense, tongues, they shall cease. When Paul wrote this, was the gift of tongues still in action? But was a day coming when it was going to stop? Okay. He says, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Now that don't mean humans can't think. It's talking about the spiritual gift of knowledge. He says, for we know, present tense, would we include Paul? For we know in part, and we prophesy, or speak in part. So when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, did he know it all? Did he have more to learn? Well, what would you call a person that was learning? Growing? How about maturing? Okay. He says, we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but... When that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now, people want to make that which is perfect Jesus Christ. Folks, Jesus, you wouldn't refer to a human being as that which. What, how, what do you call that, George? An um, impersonal pronoun? It's called something. That which, yeah. Which for a thing, okay. But anyway, keep everything in context. Perfect is mature, right? He says, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now, what has he been talking about is going to stop? Signs. These sign gifts, right? He says there's going to come a time when something perfect comes that that which is in part is going to stop, right? He says, when I was a child, here Miss Ruth just quoted this, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So, Chris had a pacifier when he was two, but when Chris turned three or four, what that happens to the pacifier? He puts it away. If Chris never puts it away, it's, something's wrong, isn't there? All right, he says, verse 12, For now, when Paul wrote, we see through a glass darkly. All right, y'all see that? Well, you can't see it. There's That glass in that door right there is frosted, right? I sit here all the time through that blind and that glass, and I say, oh, here comes somebody but I don't know who it is. I can see the outline of them coming. Hey, I can tell the difference between uh, when Dina and Chris come. I can look, I can say, well, that's Dina, and I can say, well, there's Chris, you know, just because of the difference in them. But my point being is I can't clearly make them out, can I? Right? So he says, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. When is then? When that which is perfect is come. Now, people want to make this the second coming. That's not what Paul's talking about. Watch. For now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth. Watch which gifts are going to remain. Faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. So then did they have sign gifts back here? Yeah, just name some of them. He just gave us a bunch of them. Healing, okay? And, and look, let's make this clear. Signs is something you can see. A visible healing, right? Do I believe you pray to God today for sick people? Yeah, Paul said so. Do I believe God will help? Yeah, I do. Is he going to do it in a supernatural, miraculous way so it can be seen? No. Nope. How about tongues? Folks, all tongues ever meant, the Greek word is gloss, so it means language. Was it gibberish when the twelve spoke in tongues? It was legitimate language that the other people heard it in. Was it to show those people what great men they were? Or was it so they could understand the message, understand the preaching? What were these signs always in support of? The message. The message about what Christ is doing. Now think about today. People say these signs, want, they make out today, they take that which was just a tool back here and they make it the end product, don't they? Have anybody ever heard of the second blessing? Y'all familiar with that? Okay. Um, 
there are people today and they use the term full gospel. And look, please don't think I'm, I'm making fun of them. I'm not. I, I don't mean that at all. But they claim they preach the full gospel. And what they really mean by that is we preach everything in our message and the proof that they do that, they say, is these signs. They say God's will is that a person would get saved, right? But then it's not really complete until that person gets the second blessing. And what do they say that is? It's supernatural powers, right? They say the powers confirm the person's salvation. So the other people know that person's saved. Now that's what they're preaching. I promise y'all, you check it out. Are they making that empowerment the end product? And yet what did Paul say was the end product? Jesus Christ died for your sins. What was Paul's message? Jesus Christ died and your sins are paid for. These signs were just to get the people to listen to the message. Today, they could care less about the message and they get on TV and they say, I got a lady here that wants to talk to y'all. Tell them, she said, oh, I had back pain and, and this man put his hands on me and the Lord healed me and they all holler, praise God, he's wonderful. Next, where was the gospel? What did they say? They do. They do. So think basically what are they trying to imitate? The things that were taking place on the day of Pentecost when the church was a baby. They're sucking on a pacifier. Think about on the day of Pentecost. Have y'all ever wondered why the Charismatics call themselves Pentecostals? That's why. They're saying we're going back to Pentecost. I mean seriously, what if Chris come in today in a diaper? I mean that's crazy, isn't it? Seriously, that you say, hey, this is going in the wrong direction, isn't it? Folks, that's what the church is doing today. If y'all can picture that, that's what's going on, okay? Another few years, huh? <laughs> Just to show you real quick about the signs, go over to uh, chapter 14. Now, in the Corinthian church, they still had these gifts. Paul's still going to the Jew first. The word of God's not complete. The gifts are still happening. But Paul's telling them, hey, that's going to fade away. Y'all are putting y'all are putting all the emphasis on these gifts, and the gifts aren't the point. The point is the preaching of Jesus Christ, isn't it? So Paul goes on to tell them, he says, uh, verse uh, chapter 14, by the way, what were the Corinthians doing with their various gifts? Competing for glory. One said, I got the gift of prophecy. So another one jumped up and spoke in tongues. You see, there, it's for the individual's glory. Watch what the gifts were for. Chapter 14, verse 22, Paul tells them, Wherefore tongues are for a sign. Correct. Not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Now think about how they do it today. They come together inside a building. In their little private meeting, somebody speaks in tongues, and they all say, that confirms that person saved. Is that how it happened on the day of Pentecost? Folks, the believers were in a little room together. Ain't nobody speaking in tongues. They left their private meeting and went out in public and spoke in tongues. Today, they leave public and go into their little private meeting and speak gibberish. How does that preach the gospel? It doesn't. And please, I'm not making fun of folks. We're, we've been misled. We've been, like Wendell's dad told me one time, he said, hey, I ain't going to say all of what he said. He said I've been hoodwinked. <laughs> he, but my point being is here. You and I are not supposed to be regressing. We're supposed to be growing in the truth of the word, aren't we? Well, let's take a look at how this progression begins. Now go back, if you would, to uh, Mark 1.1. 1, 1. All right, Mark 1.1. 1, 1. Yeah, I, I can't see anything else that could be, Christine. And I know the right division world doesn't like that, but Psalm 139 says what it says. Um, all right, now, in Mark 1.1, 1, 1, please notice what it says. The beginning, all right, is that a start? The beginning of the gospel, or the good news, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Then did the gospel of Christ have a beginning? Okay. Now, I'm not telling you that these men were preaching the full gospel of Christ back here. I'm telling you this is how it had a beginning. 
I mean, if I want to eat corn today, do I just go walk out there and find corn laying on the ground, or do you have to plant a seed? It, it's coming to maturity, right? So how did all this begin? It began back here with the preaching of Jesus Christ, didn't it? Now, Jesus Christ begins to preach some things here. Okay? And for the most part, do his disciples understand? No. But does he begin revealing some things that are a mystery to them? He does. Now, he's preaching two different things, two different avenues. That's the thing that people don't recognize. And if we don't rightly divide these two messages, it causes all this confusion. All right? First off, had Jesus Christ come as the king of Israel with a message for this group of people? All right? What were this group of people under when Jesus Christ came? All right? They had entered into a law contract, right? What did that law contract require that that nation, as a nation, do in order to get out of that contract? It, it either die, death, right? Or confess that they had failed, publicly get washed, showing they, they were unclean. This, th this thing required a confession. They needed to repent, right? Change their mind. You're not keeping the law, so Chris has got it. They needed to repent be baptized okay, and confess their failure. Folks, the idea of confessing sins the way religion teaches it today is never found in the Bible like they're saying it. Has there ever been a case where a man had to confess each one of his sins to get each one of them forgiven? But that's what they're teaching today. Folks, if me and you had to confess each one of our sins to get them forgiven, what if we forget one? We're in trouble, aren't we? All right. This contract also said they needed to confess their iniquity, singular, and the iniquity of their fathers. Now, how am I going to confess my father's sins? I mean, he was a pretty rotten character, but I don't know all his sins, do I? But what could these people say they had done? They broke the covenant. We broke the covenant, and guess what? So did our fathers and their fathers. We are unrighteous. We will never get the kingdom by our performance, and that is exactly what John showed up preaching, isn't it? Okay? Jesus Christ himself preaches that same thing to them, doesn't he? But watch what it says. Flip over. Chapter 14. Did I tell y'all go to chapter 14? Yeah. I'm sorry, y'all. Verse four, Mark 1, 14. God. See, I'm talking about Alzheimer's. I'm, I'm failing here. All right, Mark 1, 14. <clears throat> it says, Now after that John was put in prison, as soon as Israel, had, John's locked up in prison, what do you know? Israel as a nation is not going to do what they're supposed to do, are they? Does everybody agree with that? John was like Elijah. Jesus said if they would accept John's preaching, then that the message would, right? But they, they deny it, don't they? So it says, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Did he tell them to repent and get baptized and confess? He tells them to repent and believe the gospel. Jesus Christ is now beginning to preach something called the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now, is the kingdom of God a spiritual kingdom or a physical kingdom? Spiritual. But what kind of kingdom was this group looking for? physical. So while Jesus Christ is talking to this group about a physical kingdom, they're rejecting him in each city, what does he begin teaching those that believe? About a spiritual kingdom. Does that make sense? These two things are running side by side. It's the failure to separate this that causes so much confusion here, right? Now, in this particular message over here, who has got to accept it first? Israel. One or two of them? All of them, right? Did they ever accept it here? Therefore, I'm just going to take this and, and loop it around over here. 
Paul says at the second coming, they're going to see him, aren't they? What do the Jews require? When they see him and look on him, what will they do? They're going to every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, right? Who did Paul say would be saved over here? All Israel. Okay, does that make sense? Go ahead, George. He did. You got it. He, when Paul says he's like one born out of due time, that doesn't mean past the due date. It means premature. How did Paul get saved? He looked on the Lord. And boom. Me and you didn't get saved that way. That's how Paul got saved. Now, it, what physically happened to Paul is physically going to happen to them over here. But what spiritually happened to Paul ought to spiritually happen to each one of us. When Paul saw the Lord, what did he see? bright shining light y'all remember Hank Williams right I saw the light what does Paul say the light is the glorious gospel of Christ what is it that shines unto you and I what is it that Paul's preaching over here the gospel of Christ does the gospel of Christ say repent and be baptized every one of you confessing your sins when that man asked Paul what must I do to be saved what was his answer believe what's happening is there's a there's a change taking place Israel is slowly city by city Paul's finding the few that will believe it he? but what's happening all this stuff's going away it's fading away folks but what did the churches do today they drug it along like an anchor folks if you require a sign today you're not walking by faith now if you walk by sight okay has anybody ever seen Benny Hinn has he got an audience full of people walking by sight? Does he ever once, somebody please tell me the day that that man preached what Jesus Christ actually did on the cross. You ain't never heard it. Not once. I'll tell you what you will hear every five minutes. How people have been blessed through his ministry. And because God is, is so proud of this man and working through this man, the only way you can get a blessing is through that man because he's God's man. And what's the avenue by which the blessings come? Send your money in. Now, y'all really, come on. It don't take common sense to know what that man's after, does it? But how does he prove to his audience he's God's man? By these signs and wonders, okay? All right. So then we've got a, a church that ought to be growing up. What it literally ought to be growing out of is growing out of Judaism, okay? This thing is going to grow up out of Judaism until today. I mean, the church, for the most part, for the last 1,900 years, is a pr comprised of mostly what? Gentiles. But what did the Jewish believers back here do? They wanted to hang on to their position. Folks, if we had a, all right, let's say it was 1880 and... It's in uh, oh, some little town in North Mississippi. And all of a sudden, uh, uh, one black person comes into the all-white church. And the next day, you know, he brings a friend. What is the, what is the white people going to say? Hey, we've got to stop this. We've got to get control of this, right? We're in danger of losing our position, right? Well, what do you all reckon the Jews said when they saw all these Gentiles getting saved? Same thing. Why did Paul say God was doing this? To provoke them to jealousy. Alright, so as the Jew back here is, is in the church and Paul brings Gentiles into the church what do the Jewish believers tell the Gentiles? You got to be circumcised and keep the law. Then what are they trying to do? Drag in that junk. Did they drag it in? Yeah. And where, Has it ever ended? Yeah. They drug in their ritual washing, baptism, they drug in their, their Passover supper, they drug in everything, didn't they? So rather than grow up out of its Jewish roots, the church has just gone back to them. They, you, they did not understand at all what was going on, did they? All right, so as, as you and I look at this, you and I are supposed to see something that is, in, uh, is being revealed, right? Now, Jesus Christ begins to, to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. In other words, he begins telling them about a spiritual kingdom, doesn't he? Who is the man that Jesus Christ picked to give it all to? Paul. Did Paul get it all at once? So when Paul wrote Corinthians right here, he said, I know in part, right? 
and I prophesy in part. He said, but when that which is perfect is come, I shall be known as I am, as I am, right? I'll know as I am known. Did Paul reach a point over here where he got the full revelation of the mystery? Yeah. And when he got the full revelation of the mystery, guess what? You ain't got no more signs. I mean, it's very simple if you just read the Bible. In the book of Acts, could Paul perform signs, wonders, and miracles? Did he perform them right up to Acts chapter 28? He sure did. After Acts 28, somebody show me one miracle. You can't find one. Hey, Paul's traveling, and he's got a guy sick who's preaching with him, right? You know what Paul tells him? He, said, he tells Timothy, drink a little wine for your stomach. He tells the Colossians, he says, I left Epaphroditus back there sick, nigh unto death. I pray the Lord helps him. Why didn't he heal the man? It, would, it, meant it had no purpose. Folks, today people are acting like that what God would have is for you to have this blessed, healthy life. I'm not telling you God don't want you to be healthy. He gave us a whole book with some health codes. Look at the Moses Law. That's good health codes, isn't it? I mean, I'm not telling y'all we need to follow Moses' law, but for instance, is eating pork healthy? No, everything in the law, washing your hands, we, we know we ought to do, right? But is the end product God's looking for for you to have a healthy, good physical life, or is it for all men to be saved and come under the knowledge of the truth? Has anybody ever been saved by a sign? Every time they did signs, what followed it? Preaching a message. All right, the message today is called the gospel of Christ. Does everybody agree with that? All right, now if I come over here, let's just do this real quick, and then we're going to take a break. Go to a Matthew chapter 3. <clears throat> if I don't make a division, you put me a big line up here. If I don't recognize, I'm going to put a line here, okay? And I'm going to put a line over here. Right? If I don't recognize a change that takes place, not only here, but also through here, then what I'm going to wind up doing is I'm going to try and preach my message inclusive of everything that happened here all the way to here, and I'm going to call myself a full gospel preacher. And since I'm not recognizing some changes, what am I going to need to do? I'm going to need to do all those signs that they did, right? Hey, that guy, did y'all see the rattlesnake handler that got killed last year? Discovery Channel rattlesnake guy? Okay. Paul told them, or not Paul, Jesus told the apostles they'd pick up a snake and it wouldn't harm them, right? All right. If I believe that if I picked up a rattlesnake, it couldn't hurt me, do y'all think I would pick it up like this? No. Ain't that how they handle them? Right? Now, he handling the snake, snake bit him. The guy hit the floor in his congregation. Y'all have seen it, right? What did the members of his congregation do? 911. Now, folks, if I get bit by a snake, please call 9. That's the right move, isn't it? But y'all know what they all proved that day? They didn't believe their own baloney, did they? He said, handle snakes, not harm them. Drink any deadly thing that won't hurt them. Lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. If they really believed, they'd have just put their hands on him, wouldn't they? Okay. So the reason you and I don't need to imitate those things today is because we've got that which is perfect. We've got the complete Word of God, whereby... Anybody on the face of the planet today can be saved simply by preaching what Jesus Christ did for them. No signs, no wonders. I don't need anything to confirm. I got the word right there. All right, so in Matthew 3, verse 1, it says, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All right, we're going to do it like this. I've got Matthew chapter 3 right here. Did John just preach, repent, get baptized, kingdoms at hand? In, in Matthew 3, right? Okay. In, uh, well, it says, they're gonna, verse 6 says, they were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins, right? Jesus Christ comes, he gets baptized. Jesus goes and he starts preaching. Look in uh, verse 12. Now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, Matthew 4, 12, I'm sorry. When Jesus heard, had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. It talks about he's going to start preaching. Watch what it says in verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Is Jesus preaching the same thing in chapter 4? Okay, watch what it's called. Verse 23. 
Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Notice it doesn't say kingdom of God. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing all manner of sickness, all manner of disease among the people. All right, come over to chapter 10. Chapter 10, verse 1. When he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, heal all manner of sickness, all manner of disease. Why would they need to have that power? Because they're fixing to go to the Jews. Folks, watch. He names them by name, the twelve. Verse 5 says, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. Into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, say, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Is the kingdom of heaven a message about a spiritual kingdom or about a physical kingdom? It's a physical kingdom. So then in John chapter 3, or Matthew 3, John is preaching this message, isn't he? Then it, it's, and by the way, let's put it up here. It's called the gospel of the kingdom here. And I'll put in parentheses heaven. Now he says, in 4, Jesus preaches it to Israel. In Matthew 10, the 12 preach it to Israel, don't they? Okay. They're preaching the, the gospel of the kingdom. All right. They're preaching it unto Israel, and Israel is rejecting it. Now, this is in Matthew 10. So, did the apostles then know the gospel of the kingdom? All right. They know what it is to preach it, don't they? Two years later, just flip from 10, 11, 12, 13, all the way to 16. And y'all check it out on your own. This is, it's uh, about two years, okay? Jesus asked the, asked the apostles when they come back, who are the people saying I am? And they're saying one says you're this one, one says you're that one. Peter says you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Verse 17, Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, upon this rock I'll build my church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He goes on talking about giving him the kingdoms, but look at verse 20, or the keys. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Now wait a minute. They're going out preaching this message and he said, Don't tell anybody I'm the Christ? Why? Hey, what, folks, what, what did this nation have to do first? They had to confess their fact. They're under the law contract. All right? But those that do confess, guess what they begin seeing? He's the Christ. And he says, tell nobody. Now watch what it says next. Verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders, chief priests, scribes, be killed and be raised again the third day. Is this Matthew chapter 16? If he just began to tell them this about the cross in Matthew 16, how could they have been preaching it in Matthew 10? Anybody see that? Then when they preached the gospel of the kingdom to Israel, has it got anything to do with the cross? No, it has nothing to do with it. Then as Paul goes out, and Paul says, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, and he says how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he's raised again the third day according to the scriptures. Did Paul's gospel have something to do with the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Did the twelves back here? Then are they preaching the same gospels then? No. Then is the gospel of the kingdom the message Paul's preaching? Then part of maturing, Peter gets over here, did the Jews accept their preaching? They rejected it. So what is Peter and them going to have to learn to do? They better realize that went aside and grow up and start seeing the truth, shouldn't they? But what did most of them want to do? They want to keep preaching this message. What did the church keep on doing? I mean, ask somebody today if you've got to be saved, what, what must I do? What's the first word you're going to hear from most of them? Repent, get baptized, confess, right? Look, I'm not against repenting, folks. We need to repent. We need to have a change of mind. I need to quit trusting that there's something I can do to be righteous and trust the finished work of Jesus Christ. Hey, you can get baptized till the cows come home. They ain't going to do nothing but get you wet. Now, I also believe in baptism, but I don't believe in that baptism. 
Paul said over here for us, he says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Then you say, do you believe in repenting? Yes, I believe we need to change our mind. Absolutely. I need to quit believing what the guy who has been preaching this to me all my life is telling me and believe what Jesus Christ did. Do I believe in baptism? Yes, absolutely. I believe we need to be baptized, but it ain't got nothing to do with water. It's a spiritual baptism. The Holy Spirit places you. The guy said, hey, you don't even believe. How about, sir? Yeah, I believe we need to be circumcised. We've got a spiritual circumcision that we need to undergo through Jesus Christ. Everything we need, who did it? Jesus Christ. Did Paul know all of this back here? When did Paul come to this revelation? After Acts over here he comes to it. He comes to that which is perfect. And from that point forward, what do you not find Paul doing? Signs, wonders, baptisms, nothing. He don't do any of that, does he? So then, was Paul growing up in the Lord? Is he our pattern? then what should me and you do? Grow up or go back to the pacifier? Okay, let's take a break.